It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 46. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and here we take a look at the headlines in the world of creationism from the past week. Once again, we're back to Ken Ham. Ken Ham is on a, a roll. He is calling out compromisers right and left, and this time it's Tim Keller. I want to talk about that for a few minutes. He also has a little bit of something to say about the Asbury revival that's going on. Uh, Answers in Genesis has a bunch of mixed messages with respect to species. They've recently run a poll asking their followers what they think about how species change. And the results are rather interesting. We've got that, a couple other items, a couple other fun items, I hope. All of that coming up next. So, as I said, Ken Ham has been, um, he's just been on a mission to call out everybody who is, in his mind, compromising the gospel by having erroneous views of various portions of scripture. Uh, calling him back to what he calls the authority of scripture, although I certainly think that many of these people he's calling out certainly have a, a healthy respect for the authority of scripture, as healthy a respect as Ken Ham has. And this time he goes after Tim Keller. Now, if you don't know him, Tim Keller is a rather well-known uh, pastor in the Presbyterian Church of America, uh, a reformed denomination. Uh, he, uh, his ministry was mostly focused in, the, in New York City. Um, he's written dozens of books, well-known author, well-known speaker, um, known for his um, gracious way of operating in a you know an urban city environment and being able to really connect with people in, in you know where people are at and bringing him the gospel he's no slouch in terms of bringing it strong all right but he has found a way to bring the gospel in a in, in a strong way but with a, a in a loving way at the same time and so here we have ken ham pointing out that uh, he, he takes advantage of the fact that the Gospel Coalition has begun a new uh, center, the Tim Keller Center for Apologetics, in order to carry on the work of Tim Keller when he's gone. And, and Tim Keller is, uh, uh, you know, not long for this world right now, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, things have been put into place such that some of his vision can uh, proceed. All right, so what does Ken have, have to say about Tim Keller? All right, this I have to admit, this particular diatribe against Ten Keller kind of worked me up, and uh, this is the type of thing that gets me upset. I mean, I mean, maybe probably that's because I'm not like a a giant Tim Keller fan. I have some of his books. I read his books. I appreciate his work. We would disagree slightly in a, a number of different theological ways, but overall, I certainly value his contributions. So what does Tim Keller, well, sorry, what does Ken Ham have to say about Tim Keller? So Tim Keller says, American Christianity is due for a revival, but I don't believe true revival can happen until there's a new reformation. He's constantly calling for a new reformation, right? He's even written articles about how the Ark Encounter and others are going to begin a new reformation. He's had a theme for various years of a new reformation this year and likened himself to Nehemiah, you know, as, as, as sort of bringing about this, this reformation, a, a renewal in people's interest in the authority of Scripture. I don't believe true revival can happen until there's a new rev uh, a reformation to call church leaders like Tim Keller back to the authority of the word of God beginning in Genesis. Much of the lukewarmness of the church in our era started when church leaders began to compromise with the religion of naturalism in the 1800s. All right, this is just boilerplate stuff that he says about every single issue. He, he uh, repeats this uh, oversimplified view of history in which uh, if in his mind, everything boils down to giving up or uh, compromising on the age of the earth. And that's where it all began, right? The church began to fall apart at that point, as if the church were somehow some solid force in the, in the 1800s before this happened. Um, the church began by trying to add a, the a millions of year belief into the Bible, resulting in all sorts of compromised positions like the gap theory, day, age, and so forth. Then many church leaders accepted varying degrees of Darwinian evolution, eventually the Big Bang. All this undermined the authority of Scripture and resulted in generations being raised without the foundation of Genesis chapters 1 through 11, which is the foundation of all doctrine, right? So there again is his, his 
primary you know mission is to bring people back to Genesis 1:11 because without that somehow it would be impossible to actually have a correct view of the rest of scripture um, the rest of the Christian worldview and really everything right <laughs> everything is founded in Genesis that's why there's ministry is called answers in Genesis a Tim Keller apologetic center all right so now here's the dig won't help this situation because he has adopted evolutionary ideas into Genesis. True revival can't take place without the right foundational history. Christians need to wake up and understand the foundational importance of the book of Genesis. Tim Keller has written and supported BioLogos, one of the leading compromise organizations, trying to get the church to reject a literal, literal Genesis. Read Tim Keller's position here, and then he, you know that goes to an article that they written years ago about um, all the issues that they have uh, with Tim Keller. Right, so he's saying, here, here they're opening this, uh, this Kim, Tim Keller Apologetic Center, right? They're uh, bringing in a bunch of fellows they're going to train to be able to uh, take the word out to the nation into this new world of the United States, which Tim Keller, and I tend to agree with him, is, is sort of in a post-Christian state, all right? Rather than treating it as if everyone knows the Bible and the foundation of, of, of this country is, is, is Christian. We really are entering a stage in which there are um, a large percentage of people don't have a Christian heritage. And the apologetics methods, all right, the Christians have used in the past, which almost kind of assume that there's a, a basic knowledge or basic biblical knowledge that uh, everyone kind of has, um, you would say isn't there. And we need to build an understanding of the scripture and that's done in a different way with those who are completely naive it's almost like a missionary is going out to the world in which um, you know they've never heard the word at all anyway that's the challenge that, that tim keller is is interested in taking up and um does ken ham have anything positive to say at all about this you know like he doesn't believe that any of this work that that this cannot produce a revival like all this effort can do nothing really in his mind because ultimately at the end of the day he's a compromiser and so god and really what the message is is god's not going to really support a compromiser god's not going to use a compromiser um, now i happen to think that tim keller is not really much of a compromiser but even if he were all right that would simply mean he's a sinner who has a a a somewhat incorrect view of god's uh of god's word understanding uh, of scriptures and but that doesn't mean that god can't use broken vessels because he does use broken vessels like everyone is uh has error and he uses sinners right um and even if you thought that it was going to be difficult for him to really be successful because of the the he'll be inhibited by this uh lack of understanding of genesis um i think you have to at least have some support for fellow christians who have proven to have done excellent work in the past and been recognized for the many conversions that Tim Keller is responsible for, for the many Christians who are, are doing good work in this world right now as a result of Tim Keller's uh, uh, ministry, right? I would say his ministry is very, I hate to use the word successful in ministry uh, in the sense of numbers, but Tim Keller is clearly had a profound influence on the growth of Christianity. And I would, in my mind, in all positive ways, um, as opposed to, well, let's leave it there. <laughs> all right. So, you know, Ken Ham just, he cannot, he cannot find it in himself to even sprinkle in a little positivity into any of his statements, right? He can't say, I appreciate this, but I wish Tim Keller was this. I call him back to uh, a better understanding of this and then his ministry would be even better. And, you know, so we support his ministry. We support what he's doing. Um, he's done these great things. I mean, after all, is, is Ken Ham also telling people not to read C.S. Lewis books? I mean, don't go out and read the Chronicles of Narnia because C.S. Lewis was a compromiser, right? You know, is is like saying, are you going to say that C.S. Lewis didn't do any good at all? And we just and and having reading his works could not possibly lead to revival. It couldn't lead anyone to Christ because he's a compromiser. Likewise, with like a lot of really famous Christians over the last hundred years. Right. Just listen to Terry Mortensen. He goes on in his talks and he lists off dozens 
of really well-known and well-respected theologians, seminarians, pastors, all right, who in his mind are all compromisers. In fact, the list of non-compromisers is so short, we can hardly, hardly even identify any really famous non-compromisers. And so in, in the eyes of Ken Ham, really the, nobody out there can actually do any good. They're all so flawed that God can't possibly bless any of their works because they have compromised on Genesis 1:11 on the foundation. I think the very evidence before Ken Ham's eyes about the success and the of all these other folks, right? Other these other Christians is evidence in itself that Ken Ham may be standing on the wrong wrong foundation. Okay. Oh, I was going to point out, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that Ken, uh, that Tim Keller has published a lot of books. Uh, I have several of them on my shelf. I don't know if any of them are behind me right now, but uh, and I've read several of his books, and I find them really helpful. They're they're really excellent works. Uh, and there's the Tim Keller uh, Center for Cultural Apologetics, which is at the Gospel Coalition uh, website. Okay, let's move on. Although we're going to stick with Answers in Genesis for now. So Answers in Genesis YouTube channel uh, under the, uh, what was it, the um, community tab. All right. They post various things. And what they do once in a while is they have polls there. All right. And uh, they did this poll a couple months ago. I kind of forgot about it and I thought it would bring it up here. Uh, do animal species change over time? All right. I think it's a very poorly worded uh, question. On the other hand, it gave some very useful feedback uh, for me to see. Like, what do primarily Answers in Genesis followers, right, subscribers to the YouTube station, what, what is their reaction to a question like this? And you can see there was uh, 15,000 votes. So this is, you know, a lot of people responding. And uh, do animal species change over time? 39% said yes. 43% said no. 18% said sort of, you can see I chose sort of, I need to select something so I can see the results. Um, and so do animal species change over time? Okay, now remember answers, let me just remind you, Answers in Genesis believes that uh, God created kinds of organisms, which is a rough, broad category of things like all canines. And so within the canines, there's many different species. And those species have changed from one kind of species to another. And so therefore, technically, right, Answers in Genesis believes that species change over time. Uh, so what do their followers think? Do they think that species change over time? It looks like they're kind of split on it, right? It looks like half of more than, well, uh, more think that they don't change than they do change. Right. And others are not sure for a variety of reasons. Um, but that's not necessarily what it sounds like. I think really what it what it tells us is, is that answers in Genesis uh, followers don't actually know what a species is and they don't really know what a kind is. And they're not they don't really understand the answers in Genesis um, uh, literature. Right. Answers in Genesis has really, although I think they try to be as clear as they can in recent years, they've kind of evolved over time uh, in the way they use language of kinds and species and how they talk about species changing or not changing uh, and speciation. And so how they've used those terms has changed. I think that's confused their audience and their audience doesn't really understand the difference between species and kind. I think it's pretty clear. I'm going to read you some of the responses. And in some of the responses, it's pretty clear that a lot of them think that a species is a kind. Um, and other ones understand that species, and, and therefore, since species are kinds, they can't change, right? So they just assume they can't change. Others have this idea that species change, but they think that they're, um, well, some of them are actually completely confused. They think that some things are kinds, and they're actually upset that Answers in Genesis is saying that kinds can change, like, you know, wolves and can change into coyotes or something like that. And they think that's wrong. All right. Not understanding that Answers in Genesis believes that species can change. Um, yeah. And so all I'm going to do here is I just want to read a couple responses. I just picked out a few. I mean, there was a thousand responses. Actually, you see, there's 1.3. So 1,300 responses, written responses. Uh, this is a huge number compared to most polls. So this obviously caught a lot of people's interest 
Uh, and I think the confusion of the matter uh, led to a lot of discussion. So here we have uh, a giraffe can over time breed desirable characteristics such as a longer neck, which enables the animal to thrive. The ability to access food resources from taller trees. If the females of the species observe that this is a desirable trait to pass on to the young. Hmm. Now this, I, I, I pulled this one out because this is almost Lamarckian uh, rather than Darwinian, right? Lamarckian is like, oh, uh, if a giraffe um, reaches up and gets a longer neck and enables the, that animal to thrive, that individual to thrive, if the female of the species observes that this is a desirable trait, right? If the if the female looks and says, "Hey, that's a really good trait," let's let's go ahead and pass that on to the next generation, as if they're deciding the the traits. Um, more females will breed with longer neck males, and over time, they get longer necked giraffe herds. But can a giraffe evolve into a gazelle or a rhinoceros? Oh, of course not. So. Yes, giraffes can change over time, although that's really just change within a species. So yes, and this is part of the confusion. Can species change? Well, even one species can adapt and change over time, even if it's not changing into another species. So some people are confused about, do you mean that species change from one to another? Or do you just mean that species can change? And a lot of people recognize that, oh, of course, populations, species can adapt and change. Uh, that's no problem. There's no proof. Only that educational science is teaching uh, through evolution is truth. Uh, and that biblical respect is nothing but a fairy tale. However, evolution was invented by Darwin. And though he concluded it a, and concluded it a theory, the science, in other words, liberals, community, decided it was the best way to default the Christian idealism simply because they are atheists. All right, that's representative of 50 to 100 responses. All right, just indignant that uh you know why are we even asking this question this is all just uh superfluous stuff that is made up by by others non-christians if animals uh will adopt um like i guess that is if animals will adopt adapt it says adopt but it means adapt to the environment um i can even read that sentence an animal will adopt to adapt to his environment it's in okay Example animals in Canada, like bunnies and rabbits in winter, they have white fur color uh, coat in, su in summer. They have brown fur coat. Other rabbits in parts of the world uh, don't because they don't need to blend in with their, I guess, their environment. They adapt, but they don't change species. So they are changing over time due to their different environments, but no, they are, complete, they are not completely changing into a different species. They're just adapting to the environment. All right, so there's... There's another typical response of somebody who's saying, yes, a species, individuals in a species can adapt to their environment, but a species cannot change into another species. Um, and that's definitely not Answers in Genesis position. And yet I think most of these people are big fans of Answers in Genesis and think that Ken Ham has, you know, got it all together and is telling them everything they need to know. So what this tells me is that um, although Answers in Genesis tries to communicate this stuff and they write this stuff, it's still confusing to the general audience. They're still confused. They still have big misconceptions about what the leadership and what the people at Answers in Genesis are actually trying to teach them. Uh, and part of that's because they've been brought up kind of just understanding that, you know, all evolution is bad. And they're barely getting to the point where they can accept that, right, obviously species can change within a species. Uh, microevolution within within the genetic possibility, all right? So yes, you can have microevolution changes within populations within the genetic possibility, like dogs. Dogs can change size and color, but not into fish or a bird. Fish change into the same kind of fish or various sizes and colors, but essentially remain in that species. So there, this person's using the word species. So they, they also think that change can happen within a species, but they're not seeing it as one species becoming another. Although maybe they think that dogs are all canines because Ken Ham does make a big deal about all canines being the same kind. You know what that means? Dogs stay in their species and fish in their species. I think this person actually probably thinks species are kinds uh, or, or actually has in mind dogs as being all canines and all canines remain as canines. Uh, and that would be all canines remain as the same kind. They should be using that word rather than the word species. 
species is not equated with uh, a kind. All right, so all these things, all, all I'm doing is, is demonstrating that if you read hundreds of responses, I would say out of the 1,300 responses, I haven't looked at every single one of them, but I looked at a good number of them, uh, I would say a very small percentage, less than 10%, actually kind of like can answer the question just the way Answers in Genesis is trying to train them. All right, they're, they, they're all over the place in terms of answering these questions. Uh, have you not read the Bible? God said he made the serpent to crawl on his belly after the sin of Adam and Eve in the Adam Gene. We know that animals change colors and adapt parts over time naturally, but it's, that's not evolution. They adapt in their environment, but never change species. Dogs are an example of this. Never has any species, there's the word species again, morphed into another. And despite what scientists say, it has never been observed in the fossil record. Environments cause uh, changes, cause changes in gene expression that can aid in survivability. So there's another person who is clear. This person clearly is thinking particular species. One species cannot change into another species. Right? I don't know what happens to these individuals when it finally sinks in that Answers in Genesis is actually saying that, yes, species can become other species, right? Species split into multiple different species, and sometimes they've split into hundreds of different species um, based on evolutionary mechanisms. Um, you know, I, d I don't know what kind of uh, cognitive dissonance this causes, you know, uh, uh, to folks that that have been trained to think that species are, are kinds. It depends on the definition of change. The species can change, alter due to environmental needs or selective breeding, but the species does not change or transform into different species. See, the very next, the very next response. Kind of like genes were washed in bleach, they would change or alter color, but they would not change or transform into shirts or socks, right? So there the species can't change into another species. But does this person actually mean species is like wolves versus coyotes? Or do they think species is all canines? I'm not sure. They may not be sure. They may not really have a conception of kind and species in their head. Um, lastly, if you're a Christian, you need to know this, people. If you don't read the Bible, then you can be deceived uh, you can be deceived. This poll is disturbing that many Christians believe in evolution. Go listen to Answers in Genesis on YouTube. <laughs> I did, I'm not showing you a lot of the, a lot of the answers in which uh, it's pretty clear that I'm not showing you a lot of the answers in which the individuals say that, yes, species can change, right? Because half of the individuals said that, close to half, said species can change. And I think this person is looking at the result of that poll. They're like, what in the world? You know, half the people responding to this poll are saying that species can change. Answers in Genesis has been telling you people, species can't change, right? That's evolution. But they don't even understand Answers in Genesis' message. So here they're telling you, go watch some stuff on Answers in Genesis um, when this person doesn't understand the, the question itself. Okay. All right, more Ken Ham. I'm sorry, it, it, Ken Ham has been a... Uh, a, a font of, of stuff that, that, that uh, can't help but be replied to. So it just keeps coming up. Um, this has to do with the recent uh, news about a potential revival that's occurring at Asbury College. And so he sent one of his staff members down there to actually witness this event and sort of give a report back and, and assess, like, is this really a, a revival, you know? Um, so, as Ken Sam says here, is it revival? Is it sincere? Is it something else? We asked one of our staff members, Patricia Engler, to go to Asbury and check it out. And uh, he writes then, he basically writes a blog post and he includes her comments, uh, her observations. And, and she concludes that it seems like these people are, are really serious. It's genuine. This isn't some sort of fake thing. Students are really seem to be uh, very much taken up with this and are really interested in learning the word and, and, and speaking about it and getting to know more. Uh, and so she sensed that, that the Holy Spirit really is at work here. But you know what's going to happen. You, you, you know what Ken Ham's response is going to be. He's going to say like, okay, here's this report that, that this could be, you know, some revival taking place. But what did I just say about Tim Keller, Right. Yeah, there, there's been plenty of people who, who have, been, have come to the Lord or gotten excited through Tim Keller, 
But does he believe that Tim Keller can really lead a true revival? A true revival? There may be revivals, but they're not real revivals unless they're based on what? You know what they got to be based on. They got to be based on Genesis 1 to 11, the foundation. If you don't have the foundation right, you can't have a real revival. So is it something else? He doesn't want to poo-poo it too much because it's like people are really loving to talk about this. And I think he understands that his audience is like excited about the news of a Christian revival. But I'm pretty sure I know how what he really thinks. And that is he's skeptical, right? He's skeptical that it can really do any good. And that you do get a sense of that right at the end. I could have. I could have written this article for him knowing exactly what he would say. I think cautious optimism is a good way to describe how we feel about the worship that is taking place at Asbury. Sadly, although Asbury, as we learn from viewing its website, teaches theistic evolution appears to be quite woke, promoting CRT-based resources, for example, certainly the school as a whole needs a revival a return to the truth of God's word in Genesis, right? So as you're reminded about the students and visitors, uh, visitors at Asbury and your social media feeds and conversation, I encourage you to pray for the students, visitors, and leadership at that school. All right, yeah, they need our prayer, your prayer because they've got off to a good start, but it's going to flounder because they don't have the real foundation. The school is woke. They're teaching theistic evolution. And based on everything else Ken Ham says about every other school that does this stuff, he doesn't hold out much hope that you can really um, receive the truth in any of these locations. So, yes, he's skeptical. Uh, there's only a few places in the world that a revival can actually happen. Um, only the places that he designates that the Holy Spirit can truly do a work of God because the Holy Spirit can only work, truly work, and truly be successful and individuals that start out with the right foundation, the foundation of Genesis 1. Now, all right, I'm, you know, I'm pushing that a little bit far. He, is gonna, he, would, he would begrudgingly say that a revival could begin in a theistic evolution college, uh, but for it to have long-term fruit, um, those students better figure out the foundation, right? So you can start, get, get the gospel message, get, get all excited, read your Bible, and then find answers in Genesis and get like, your base foundation right, uh, and then it will stick. Because in his mind, it can't stick. It just can't stick unless you, you do the rest. <sighs> yeah, we're still not done. Ken Ham Facebook posts and tweets are, I said before, he's on a rampage. It's every single day he's got to say something about the world around us, and it's, he has to... Um, bring out the evils in everything that might have anything like the appearance of any good. Little Golden Books are great fun books for kids, right? Some of you may remember reading some as a kid. I, yeah, I remember we had a bunch of them. Um, but beware, could Little Golden Books be aggressively indoctrinating your kids in socialist, left-wing, anti-God agenda? Well, I mean... Everything is doing that, according to him, unless you're reading Answers in Genesis material. Little Golden Books has published a series of various people, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Who was Ginsburg? She was a judge applauded by liberals and many conservatives and was elevated to as a great woman, leaving an impressive legacy. And he goes on to talk about some of the things she did. And then, of course, he has to mention various things that he disagrees with, that she was actually participating, you know, that she was... Um, uh, part of making decisions on right and then he he says at the end of his thing he says and I've, I, I've included an image here to show you from the book how they're promoting and how they're promoting Ruth Bader Ginsburg that you need to watch out for so let me show you the image that he provides here's the image he provides in which he he says like I'm going to show you how bad this book is by showing you this page. I'm serious, as he says. I'm gonna show you like how wrong this book is. Let me read you this page. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a hero in the fight for equality. She spent her life making the United States more equal for everyone. She paved the way and now we can all help take the next steps. We can stand up for what we believe in, fight to make the United States fairer for all. 
Yeah, what are the pictures? Somebody helping someone uh, on a, in a wheelchair, right? Ruling on lawsuits for things like ageism discrimination, uh, for racist discrimination, um, for the ability to vote and having the equal right to vote, right? Equality for all. I mean, those are the things in the images here. And sure, she's also known for LBGQ2 and, 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 other, and other, other rights things. But just on this page alone, just saying she's fighting for equality, I don't understand why we have to make that into a bad thing, right? Why does that have to be something so bad? Like, look at this. You know, she's a hero. She's fighting for equality. She's spent her life making the United States more equal for everyone, right? There should be a sense of equality for everyone. It was made in the God's image. It's just another case of Ken Ham um, doesn't like some decisions somebody has made and so has to try to, uh, rather than having a nuanced view of individuals, of people in this world, as being complex people that have made decisions you disagree with, but also have made decisions that have made the world better, right? He, he can't even acknowledge that. It's just everyone is tainted and everything they've ever done is tainted because of a few decisions that that person disagrees with. All right, one more really quick item. I just, I for some reason, I got a little bit of a chuckle out of this particular um, post by Ken Ham. Uh, the science labs we conduct at the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter are very popular. Students come from all across the U.S. to attend them. In this recent biology lab, students dissected earthworms and crayfish. Science taught from a biblical worldview perspective. Isn't that wonderful? A biblical worldview perspective on a, in an earthworm and crayfish anatomy lab, right? Dissection lab. Here's all the different organs. Here's the names of them. Uh, here's maybe some of the functions of these different organs. Um, but made into a Christian worldview. I guess at the bottom you say like, uh, and all these organs were made by God. Uh, and these organs and these organisms are were earthworms, and they give rise to more earthworms. I don't know how like what kind of things you say after that to to say like this is amazing design, I guess. Um, but in terms of the actual information learned in the lab, it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's not going to be very different than what you'd find in other labs. Uh, so I, I do understand that you know there's lots of homeschool kids out there that don't have access to the facilities that say Answers in Genesis provide. So they're providing a service at a price, you know, so this is a, a bit of a money-making operation for Answers in Genesis, right? Have your kids come for a couple days and get this laboratory experience um, and do this number of hours of lab, right, that's going to fulfill some sort of requirements. And, hey, while you're at it, your family can come too and buy tickets to go to the Ark Encounter and go to the Creation Museum for a couple of days while your, you know, while your uh, oldest son is uh, slaving away dissecting earthworms. Okay, uh, that's it. Got a scratchy throat, so I better stop now. Uh, hey, I'm Joel Duff. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with this week in creationism. What is it? Uh, episode 47 next. Coming up. Talk to you later. Bye bye. <laughs>